Okay, so I'm going to pause you with what you're doing now. And we're going to listen to a couple examples of this. Now, we heard the example of Old English. It sounded very foreign, it didn't even sound remotely like English. After 1066, when William the Conqueror comes in, French begins to begin more of an influence. As a result, the words start to look a little closer to modern English. Listen to what this sounds like when read in Middle English. Start with... This is going to be, first of all, the prologue, which this is what you are translating. The miller was a stood car for the nomis. Full of big, the miller was One lap in there, with his shoreless order, the route of March had person to the water, and barbered every vine in switch the poor, which fell to engender it the floor. Once the hero's egg, with his sway to breath, in spirit hath in every hort and hath the tender crocus, and the younger son hath in the ram in his halva course he runneth, and smaller foolish mark and melody, and that sleep in arm to meet with open ear, so pricketh the nature in the courage. Okay, listen to this again. One apple with his shore of sota. Shore of sota. One that apple with his shore of sota. What did you get? When April sank on his shores. When that April, April as in a month, with his shores soaked. Shores soaked. Soaked, good. Shores. What happens in April? Showers. When that April, with his showers soaked. In other words, when the rains of April came. When April, with his shores soaked. By the way, what do you see in that line that you also saw in Old English poetry? Alliteration. Alliteration. You also have language that sounds a heck of a lot cooler than it does today. When that April with the shower soaked. Juan that April with the shower soaked. How cool is that? You might not think it's cool, I think it's awesome. Uh, it sounds really annoying. <laughs> well, I think you're going to find that most of this, and by the way, when you read Chaucer, you probably found it super annoying. He said a nine so many times. You probably felt it was really sing-songy and strange. And that's because we don't write poetry like this anymore unless it's poetry for children. You also note it sounds a lot better in its original Middle English than it does in its modern translations. Listen to the next line here. The group of March had felt in Dolorota. Where'd you get there? And barbed every vine in switch. The drought of March hath pursed to the rota. The drought of March. What comes before April? March. March. Dry March. The drought of March had pierced, pierced to, the root. To, the root. to the root. And bathed every vine in swid the chlor. And bathed every vein or vine, specifically vine here, in sweet liquor. The liquor of water, the natural water flowing down. Of which virtue engendered is the floor. Of which virtue engendered is the floor. What happens when the rain comes down? The flowers grow. The flowers grow. Juan Zephyrus ate with his sway to breath, in spirit hath in every hort and hath the tender crocus, and the youngest son hath in the ram in his halva course he runde, and smaller foolish mark and melody. That's my favorite part. Mock in the melody. What are they doing? Making Make melody. Make melody. Small birds. Small fowls. Making melody. The tender crops. Inspired hath in every holt and hath Zephyrus. That's the wind, right? When the wind with his sweet breath inspired in every holt and hath the tender crops. What season's being described here? Spring. 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 Beautiful. It's lovely. Um, did any of you have to read The Wasteland last year for 11 English? T.S. Eliot, or T.S. Eliot, part of The Wasteland? It has a very famous opening line. Its opening line is, April is the cruelest month. 
breathing lilacs out of the dead land. That is actually an allusion all the way back here to Canterbury Tales, which opens with the line, when April with the showers come, or the showers rain. March is over, March is done, winter is done, spring is starting. And according to the prologue, in spring, what happens? The rains. Flowers. The rains, the flowers, and people get together to journey where? To the shrine of To the shrine of Thomas um, at Canterbury. Just the journey, that's the whole point of Canterbury Tales. Now, what we're going to look at right now, though, is a little bit of the evolution of language. I'm going to play a song for you that will freak you out a little bit. Wait, were they supposed to tell one story there and one story back, or two stories there and two stories back? Technically, how many? Four. Four, Four total. I two there, two back. I couldn't remember. And there were roughly, although some numbers are a little different, some translations, roughly 30 people. So how many stories were you supposed to have total? Holy cow. 120. 120 stories. Instead, you have about 22. Thus, Canterbury Tales is actually an unfinished work of literature. Well, maybe the rest hey, of that's why, no, I guess we did last. How did they... Oh. Okay, I don't remember there being 30 people, and I just forgot about the two. I, I could remember if it was one or two. Yeah, I it was one. It's really hard to keep track of all the people in the prologue because of the way that they're described. Because some of them it's like this person plus Thank three God priests. Thank you didn't ask like, all those questions about them. I was so confused just trying to keep uh, I do ask that in the AP one, so you can point well, that. Listen to this song. This song's pretty weird. This is a Middle English song. So this is what you might hear by some sort of choir during this time period. This is what we start to have. After that, roughly 1400, you get the big vowel shift. To give you an idea on the timeline, Chaucer is here. He dies in 1400. He's born something like 1340, nobody knows for sure. He's at the tail end of Middle English. And he is responsible for a lot of what we now have as modern English. Highly responsible. So 1400, you have Chaucer. Leading up to Chaucer, you have two very important events. Number one, Hundred Years' War. Number two, Bubonic Plague, Black Death. Both happen right before he's born. So right around 1340, right around there, you have essentially a third of the population wiped out, killed, destroyed dismembered, begotten, disintegrated, decayed. Now tell me this. You're living in a time where you essentially have 
your rich people and your poor people. And your poor people work for the rich people. A third of your population dies, most of them being the poor people. Because the rich people, they didn't associate. The poor people, they were separated. What is going to happen inevitably as a result of that? And what happens when labor issues? You have one third of the poor people die, but they're being used by the rich people in order for the rich people to maintain their lifestyle. Times change. It ushers in a change, and it brings about the emergence of what? The middle class. This is the birthplace of the middle class. The middle class is born out of the death and ravaging of the population by the Black Plague in the Hundred Years' War. What's the logic behind that? How does that happen? Because when there's... You need people. You need more skilled laborers. You need people. And they now have what? The poor people now have... Choices between their jobs. Yeah. They have choice. They also have this idea of supply and demand. And all of a sudden, they're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa there, fat boy. I don't have to do this for you. And also, if you want me to, you're going to have to pay me some money. And all of a sudden, the emergence of the middle class brings about this three-tiered system. So Chaucer comes into a system that is changing. The entire face of the known civilization is changing in the world that he's born into which is kind of like the situation that we have as well. The entire face of technology is changing for our very eyes. He then writes Canterbury Tales where he takes essentially 30 people from all different walks of life, all different cultures, all different areas and, and expertise and, and employment, and throws them together. You've got the rich guy with the poor guy. You have the priest and you have the wife of Bath who has multiple husbands. You have all these people Put them together and say, road trip, I want all of you to tell stories along the way. This guy sounds really annoying, the host. Definitely... The host is super annoying. But here's, here's what's really interesting about this. Chaucer basically takes a slice of life from each different group, each different level, each different occupation, and puts them all together and says, let's see what would happen if all these people were forced to be companions. And as a result, not only does it tell us a lot about the time period, but it's hilarious. And actually, Canterbury Tales is incredibly funny. I know you did not think so. I know you didn't think so. Because I gave you a very boring one to read. Nice Tales for the board. Ours would got really legit. I will say this. If you want to read one that's quite inappropriate, read The Miller's Tale. It's hilarious. And so inappropriate. Are we not reading it? No. Is it about? Is it about? What is it about? Is Jim, it about just read it. Naughty? It's hilarious. Is it about the naughty? Okay, I will give you one, one tidbit. It involves farting in someone's face. <laughs> okay. The Miller's Tale. And everything else that might go with that. Okay. It's 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 absolutely perfect. Uh, okay, okay. There's one point in there where. This guy is trying to have an affair with this other guy's wife. Nice. And so he's trying to convince the woman to um, Fart in his face. <laughs> stick her face out the window so he can kiss her. But it's dark and he can't see. So she sticks her butt out and he goes to kiss and she farts right in his face. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, anyway. It's only like 22 minutes long. It's, very, it's, very, it's not very long. You might just read it. The husband is hilarious. The guy who's the, the, the cuckolded husband. Miller the is on. really drunk. Announces that he's going to tell a story about a carpenter. Yep, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> I'm going to read it. It's, it's quite good. The, the point is this. There's a lot of toss that's very funny and very bawdy. Not all of it is super boring like what you had to read. But you've got all these people together on this pilgrimage, and they all have to tell stories. What's the prize for the best story? Oh, free meal. Free meal! Yes, Tom Stoffel. There's no such thing as a free lunch except in Canterbury Tales. So, they're all on this journey. Best story gets this, this meal. And that's ultimately the idea. But here's what Chaucer does. Every single person telling a story in the Canterbury Tales has a different character. He basically creates all these different characters, which is really kind of a forerunner for what a lot of our modern literature is all about. So he's, he's, he's before his time with a lot of this stuff. The most boring character in Canterbury Tales, partner. his name is Chaucer. <laughs> he gives the name Chaucer to the most boring of the characters. Why? In kind of an ultimate irony. He basically creates a character, gives the character his own name, and makes the character just pointless, dumb, boring. Don't know why. But it's interesting. It's weird. You know? 
I think he's messing with everybody. I think he's smarter than everybody. But what, what do you do? So Canterbury Tales comes along here, and it ushers about a change in our language. Now, we watched that TED talk at the very beginning. What were some of the, the main ideas that he was expressing in the talk? What was his thesis, his main argument? Uh, the way that we write is not the way that we talk, but texting is closer to the way that we talk. So how does he feel about texting? It's good I think it's interesting. It's interesting. Not that it's wonderful, but that it's interesting, because what does it suggest about us? We can write how we speak. Yes. And what about the evolution of our language? It's happening right in front of us. And it's getting quicker and quicker. I mean, typically evolution takes a long period of time. With language, it's happening. Oh, it's like at the beginning of X-Men, when they're always like, sometimes evolution leaps forward. And then Magneto happens. And it's a great movie. You should watch it. It is like that, and I have seen it. And ultimately, what's happening is we're able to witness this over the course of several years versus over the course of hundreds of years, the evolution of language. Now, if we look at this from Old English to Middle English to now, we see some pretty interesting things. Let's start with the word night. The knights of the round table. Imagine trying to teach someone English, and you're trying to teach spelling and pronunciation, and you get to this word, and you say, night, and the person says, N-I-T. What? And you say, no, this is pronounced night. Don't worry, the K is silent. Why would you have a K there if the K is silent? Because um, it looks cool. I mean, come on, that looks really cool. No, it doesn't. Because this I-G-H has so many different you know, ways in which you, you, you can look at it. Plus, that I-G is ig, and then, and then this, and then the K. So if you pronounce this phonetically, what does it sound like? Canigate, which is exactly the way they pronounce it in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> the Frenchman at the tower says, you silly English canigates. Okay? Because he's pronouncing it in its old English pronunciation. But then, as the vowels change and shift and everything, we no longer pronounce it like that. We pronounce it night. Basically, we pronounce three letters in here out of a six-letter word. The rest of these fall into the gaps of our pronunciation. But yet we keep the spelling around because we refuse to adapt spelling to, to various things uh, as well. Now, what then begins to happen over time is language evolves because what is the purpose of language? The entire purpose is to what? Communicate. communicate. It's the only reason we speak and write is to communicate. Because this doesn't quite cut it. Sometimes, Sometimes it does. Sometimes, Sometimes it does. It's called body language. Okay. Yeah. It is called body language. Yeah. You gotta learn it. Oh my god. I can't <laughs> do that. Good. Woo! So, so the point is this. Body language equivalent of speaking French. Yes. The point is this. Language Ooh, just has to evolve as communication evolves. And as this happens, over time, certain things change. And what we've noticed, and what we're noticing so much in today's society, is a compression of language in order to quickly communicate. We're not used to the slow communication anymore. Five days in the mail, snail mail, far too long. Now, 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 quick communication. Get the information out there as quickly as possible. Assimilate, grab, become, and everything's fine. As a result, we're starting to see this change, and where we're seeing it initially, and probably most blatantly, fast food restaurants. Let me give you an example. Drive. Thruff. Mm -hmm. Right? Drive thruff becomes what? Drive through. Have you seen that? Yes. The drive through? It's beautiful. It's, it's ugly, but beautiful. No, this is beautiful. It's beautiful. Look at how simple it is. Ruh. Now, it could do this, which would be really cool. Through. I would like that. Ooh. But it is Bruh. so Ooh. simple. Versus this. Rough? Thruff? No. Drive thruff? No. Drive through. Open all night or. And then. Wait, they did that first. Night. They did it most uh, in the most observant way. 
Because, if you think about it, you want to capture someone's attention while they're driving, you don't have a lot of space, and you want to say, here, eat here, eat now, drive through, open all night. Come on, get your food, eat, grow. Mm. In fact, pretty soon it will just say, no, no, no. You know, because that says it all. So, what we're seeing here is a change, a shift, not necessarily in how we spell, think, or say, but in how we get the word out there. And ultimately, texting is a visual language. It is a visualization of our attempt to communicate. So it just makes sense that as we attempt to communicate more quickly, the words become more condensed. Give me an example of other words that are changing or evolving for our eyes. You got things like through and night. What else? I think about Sam. I'm sure it was pronounced salmon a long time ago. With that L? The, 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 the meaningless L in salmon? Yeah. I, I text and like, I capitalize everything and put full sentences and commas, and so I, I, I don't know. Nice. I'm dead serious. Okay. Well, and that's fine. And many people would, would appreciate that. I like that. I still do that. Yeah. But how is texting evolving with or without us? What, what are some I, words? I'm saying I don't know because I don't do it. Babe is now bae. That was a really hard one for me. Because isn't doesn't bae isn't like bae before anyone else? Bae before anyone else. It has nothing to do with bae. <laughs> that so, is the that that is probably the worst thing that's come out of texting. See, so you say that just. But look at all these other ones, right? BTW, yeah. LOL, like he was saying, and now bae. What are some other? Yeah, ones? But BTW oh, is like helpful. Rafika. By the way, really quickly, or right. on my way. Oh, and why? Really quick, really no, easy, really helpful. But think about what you're saying. You're condensing language in right. order to communicate. Oh, bay is horrible and I worthless. Well, maybe what you're, maybe what you're seeing oh. is a lack of necessity. Whereas with the other ones, there's a sense of urgency exactly. to that yeah. communication. Yes. So what your well, your argument may be valid in that 20, 50, 40 years from now, bay may not exist, yeah. but all the other yeah. ones might. Yeah, they won't be it's yeah, going to be a exactly matter be of what works to the best with speed and efficiency of communication. This is how we're changing. This is what's happening to language. Emojis, they communicate so much just through visual motion. Precisely. The yeah. visual aspect of them is huge. And as they continue to evolve and change to capture either a wider range or more with less, they may become more important and more significant. Yes. What's fascinating is you're seeing things show up, change, and adapt, or attempt to and fall by the wayside. This is what happened. This is this is basically in, in a few years what has taken language thousands of years, and that's the whole point here. So when you look at Chaucer, when that April with his Charles Sorte, you're looking at language a thousand years ago. Well, really for Chaucer, it's only six or seven hundred years ago. But look at how much it's changed now. If you've got a copy of Canterbury Tales, go ahead and open to the prologue just to see what I'm talking about. I've got a good copy. Yeah. Just look. You told me I could find that one. I was Could've looking through this book. Yeah, I did. But, but I just grabbed copies for, for today. Look at the very beginning here. And compare it to what you have on that page. When that April with his shoulder was sauté versus when in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root and all. The veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. Now, what you have here is a clear attempt to do two things. What's the first thing? Continue to rhyme. Very important. Keep the same idea of Chaucer, which was end rhyme. But as a result, what is having to happen when you try to do that and maintain the first thing, which is an accurate translation? You get adverbs. That's where the problem comes in. That's why modern renderings of Chaucer are just not as good. I mean, come on. When in April sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root and all, versus when that April with the showers sorted, the drought of March that passed to the root. That's cool. Personal preference, English teacher. Yeah, the way that you said it was cool. The way that he read it was really annoying. It might just be. Yeah, it's very abrasive, that loud. The point is this. 
modern translation, you still can keep the main idea, and although it changes, it's not as drastic of a change as we saw with Beowulf because of the evolution of language. This is getting closer to what we would now recognize. So you can imagine, a few years from now, a texting version of this. It'd be like, you know, oh, there's, there's a text change here now. There's a texting version of Romeo and Juliet called Yolo Juliet. It has emojis in it. And see, it, it, that's, that's the sort of thing. If you can communicate the same ideas, granted, it will sacrifice the language, which many English teachers say is a bad thing. But if language's purpose is to communicate, and the communication of ideas and feelings in the literary sense is to communicate human emotion and human experience. And if texting and emojis can do that, they have accomplished literature. Yes. Thus the evolution of language. This is why this is so important. Now, you still have to read this stuff. Okay, you still gotta read your Chaucer, your prologue, your Knight's Tale, your Parvary's Tale, and all that stuff. But it's a little different for you because you're looking at this as a survey of English literature, of British literature which begins in 700 or so with Beowulf, continues in 1400 with Canterbury Tales. Basically, once you've read these two works, you are ready to begin the Renaissance, and then go all the way up to today. By the time we finish the summer, you will have experienced literature. I didn't say read. You will have experienced <laughs> literature from all the way 700 AD until contemporary day. And you'll see the change You'll see how it's evolved, but you'll also see there is a steady thing that is always constant. It's that human element, human experience. Like the pain of our two main characters in Knight's Tale when they are in love with the same girl. Poor, poor Emily, who wants nothing to do with them. But imagine a situation where both you and your friend have liked the same person, and what that's done to you, to your relationship what that, in this case, has done to her and her relationship. So the booklet of our kids, we would both actually know the person. Possibly. We have a different conception of romantic love than they had, though. For them, it didn't really matter knowing the person. It was immediate infatuation. And it was also this idea of the courtly romance, which is far removed from what we experience in today's society with our modern dating of, hey, Girl, what's your name, girl? So, <laughs> so ultimately, exactly. This is going to be this is going to be key in, in, in kind of our ongoing study. So what we're going to do is break this down into some key aspects, and we are going to do that by starting with the partner's tale. Now, I had you do your written responses here. Yes. To what the is the first. root? What is the source of all evil? And I want to hear some of these. So. I'll tell you what, pass them in and I'll read a couple of them. Thank you. I'm a little worried out. Alright. The root of all evil intent is, first one, pleasure. People wouldn't commit evil for the sake of, you know, this actually looks like Old English. <laughs> I think Alec has written his in some archaic form. It's a corruption of a reward system. Okay, so pleasure. I think it's when you want something you cannot have. I'm going to write down the forbidden much like we would have the forbidden fruit of some sort. Evil is not a concept that exists on its own without interpretation. You can go to the last sentence. Okay. <laughs> the worst. It's all right. Okay. It's halfway through. In a similar way, as humans have both thought up of and created evil, they themselves bring about its reality by acting in ways that cause gratuitous harm to others irrationally. Humans are the root. Because they invent it and bring it about, is what she said. Yes. The root of all evil is desire. Desire for objects, desire for power, all sorts of desire. Temptation. Corrupting them, making them evil. And selfishness, which kind of relates to those. Now, 
I am going to give you a Latin phrase that you'll probably find fascinating here. It's right over here. And you'll probably re recognize this. stories. The goal is to tell the best story. There's no other qualifications other than the best story. Who's the judge? The host. The host, the host is the one who's going with him on the journey. He's going to tell stories as well. He's going to be the judge. Everything uh, all across the board. And the best story wins a free meal. The partner is what sort of person? Not going to win. Preachy. He's a preachy person. Yeah. He's basically a traveling pastor. He's sort of like a, what's the name for the pastors who travel? An evangelist. He's a traveling evangelist, and what sort of things does he sell? Pardons. pardons. He sells pardons. He sells all sorts of objects to gain entrance into heaven. Like, for instance, the bone of a saint, which is actually a pig bone. Or he might sell a crumbled piece of paper and say that it was originally written on by a divinely inspired hero of the past. Or he might sell a little piece of glass and say it was part of a chapel in which one of the disciples actually gave a particular lecture or sermon. In other words, he's a thief. He's a fake. He's ultimately stealing money. How do we know this? You just tell them. He tells them. He says, when he's setting up his story, hey, by the way, this is what I do. It's hilarious. People buy this kind of crap. Can you believe this? I found a dead pig. I took some of the bones of the pig. I convinced people they were bones of the saints. Made a ton of money. People are idiots and morons. What does he do at the end of the story? Oh, he tells them that they can buy the pardons. Tries to buy, or tries to sell the pig bones and the pardons to everybody. The host says, dude, we're not stupid. We're not going to buy the little fake bones. And how does the partner respond? Yeah, he will. He gets super mad. He's like, don't tell them it's not real. He just told them. So he's, he's a little messed up, but he's also a complete liar. But this is what he keeps saying over and over and over again. Greed is the root of all evil. Wait, could be it yeah. says greed? Greed is the root of all evil. This is what he means by it. Now, throughout, as he continues to say this, he is commenting on how there's all these other things that are the root of all evil. Love is the root of all evil. Love of money is the root of all evil. Love of things, all these various things. But he boils it down in the end to the fact that it's the desire for these things. Oh, that's what I mean. Which is what he calls greed. In the end, what he sees as being the ultimate problem is our desire to obtain something that either someone else has or that we want, which most of you have touched upon. Something that brings us pleasure, something inherent to humans, that which we are not allowed to have, that which we are tempted by, or that which would benefit us, is the idea of greed. Can anyone summarize the partner's tale for me? Oh, okay. He one tells one. a story about these three thieves that steal a bunch of treasure, go out to this graveyard, uh, dig it up. Then two guys send the third guy back to go get a drink so they can celebrate. And meanwhile, these two guys are planning to kill this guy when he comes back. But the one guy that's getting the drinks goes and buys poison, puts it in their drinks, brings it back. They end up, the two guys are still there, stab <laughs> him, and then they drink the poison drink and so everyone dies. Precisely. And then everyone finds what they were looking for. Because what were they looking for? What? Remember what they weren't looking for in the first place? They were looking for death, and they found it. Oh, that's 